Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in today. My name is Vipul, and I lead co-marketing for VWO. I'll be your moderator for today. For those who are hearing about VWO for the first time, VWO is the world's most trusted and easiest to use A-B testing and conversion rate optimization platform. Today, joining us all the way from UK is Rich Page. Hello, Rich. Hi there. How's it going? Awesome. Great to have you. Over the last Thank 15 you. years, great. Over the last 15 years, uh, Rich has helped hundreds of businesses improve their conversion rates and online revenue using web analytics and conversion rate optimization. Now, before I let Rich introduce himself and start the presentation, there are some usual housekeeping items that I want to share with you guys. Feel free to ask questions anytime during the presentation. We'll take them up at the end of the webinar in our dedicated Q&A section. The session is recorded and the same will be shared with you uh, post the webinar. And stay till the end because Rich has a special something to share with you guys. Right, with that, uh, Rich, take it away. Hi guys, hope you're all doing well. So um, today I'm going to be presenting on quite a large topic um, and that's conversion rate optimization. In particular, I'm gonna be talking about how to go beyond just A-B testing and maximize your revenue with CRO. Now, um, many, I hear this quite often that people think that um, you can't do um, commercial optimization without doing A-B testing or that A-B testing is essential for improving websites. Now, I just wanna um, gonna go through several techniques and tips that you can do to um, really improve your revenue with all the aspects of commercial optimization. So let's get started. So who am I? Well, I improve conversion rates and sales for online businesses, all types, uh, e-commerce, SaaS, um, uh, from Disney.com all the way to, to small startup websites. And I've been doing this for 15 years now. So uh, yeah, I have a real passion for this stuff. I'm the author of two popular CRO books, first of all, Website Optimization an Hour a Day, and I'm also the co-author of Landing Page Optimization, which I did with Tim Ash um, several years ago. It was one of the pioneering books that came out on the this subject and he also created one of the most popular CRO courses on Udemy which I will be also updating soon. So why A-B testing fails six out of seven times? But this is because a video, VWO study found that only one in seven A-B tests had a winning result. Now that's quite an astounding number there um, and for those of you listening that have done A-B testing, you might not be surprised that um, that, that number is so low um, because many of you probably will have had failed tests. Um, and this, I'm gonna be teaching you how to go beyond A-B testing in this. So here's some of the other reasons why it's failed. Um, this is because they're often created randomly or just by guessing what to improve on the website, obviously not very useful. Um, hippos are often wrongly or wrongly believe they know the best ideas for improving websites. Uh, hippo is the highest paid person's opinion. Many of you may have heard of that acronym. They, uh, they often think they know best um, and, and don't always, particularly because the visitor knows best. Uh, visitor insights and feedback are not often used when creating A-B test ideas. That's the reason why they fail. Not much is learned from failed A-B tests. They can simply just um, tossed aside often and moving on to the next A-B test and hoping that one works. Now, of course, A-B tests are often set up incorrectly and sometimes even contain errors. So you can see there's lots of reasons why A-B testing fails so often. So therefore, this is what's really important that you should move beyond A-B testing into CRO. And this is because it's just one part of conversion optimization. Um, and also it's important to realize that usually you're not even gonna have enough traffic or conversions to, to A-B test everything anyway on your website. So that's another reason why it's particularly important to go and do the other parts of conversion optimization. Um, so to, to maximize your re revenue, you need to use all of these elements of CRO that I'm gonna reveal in a minute. Another reason is that doing CRO ensures that your whole website and visitor journey is improved, not just the pages that you are lucky enough to be able to do A-B testing with. Um, conversion research is a particularly important part of this conversion optimization. And therefore, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to emphasize this in a much more detail because this is such an important area and is often neglected. 
So first of all, I'm going to just go over the, the main elements in conversion rate optimization. First of all, there's conversion research. Um, and this is where you gain insights from your visitors of web analytics in particular. As I said, I'm going to be um, spending a lot more of this presentation on this particular aspect of conversion rate optimization. The second um, thing is user experience or UX. This is where you, you improve the website usability of your website so that your visitors you know, can browse and find what they're looking for a lot more easily and therefore hopefully convert into sales or leads much more easily. Then we have website persuasion. This is um, definitely more of the hot topic in conversion rate optimization at the moment where a lot of influence techniques are being used um, and copywriting and used to engage and convert many more visitors rather than just relying on hoping that your website is going to be good enough to convert them. And then lastly, A-B testing and personalization. Of course, um, many of you probably have a lot of experience with this listening, um, and that's why you want to get more from um, commercial optimization. But, that, but obviously, this is can be used to test and discover the best converting website experience. Now, as you can see, all these elements overlap. Um, so A-B testing and personalization is used all through the other three. And conversion, uh, conversion research is used um, in user experience and website pers persuasion. And also you would use that uh, um, A-B testing and personalization there. So now let's look at the elements in a bit more detail. So, so conversion research, this is where you get insights from web analytics, heat maps, visitor recordings, surveys, user testing, and expert reviews. Website persuasion, this is where you're copywriting and influence techniques like social proof, scarcity, urgency, reciprocity, hard word to pronounce it, is used. A-B testing and personalization, obviously, um, this is where A-B testing personalizations, uh, personalization is used to find the highest converting website experience. And user experience, this is where you're gonna be improving website usability and user experience, particularly in the design um, of your website and the forms and the user flow for it. So, um, as I said, I'm going to now jump into conversion research in a bit more detail. And here is this is really why it's so important. So, you shouldn't just guess at what to improve or what to A/B test on your website because this is often not going to work particularly well. Um, you may get some wins, but um, you're not going to have a very effective strategy unless you don't unless you don't do uh, conversion research. Um, it's also essential to determining what needs improving on your website and why you should do that. Um, and a lot of this research is going to be gathered from your visitors and analytics tools. Then these, these insights that you're getting from conversion research will then feed into better ideas for, the, for using in the other elements of CRO because they all overlap. And then obviously you would use A-B testing to try and um, um, to find out which ones are the best converting variations and also you use personalization for that. And then, as, as we mentioned earlier, this is often neglected, this conversion research, apart from the web analytics aspect. I, I hear this time and again, that, um, even when I speak to prospects, that so many people don't understand the real benefit of conversion research and will just, uh, they'll, they'll know, you know what their top entry pages may be um, but they won't really know a lot of, um, in terms of what their visitors think of their websites um, and so forth. So this is a good opportunity for many of you on the call with their websites to kind of stand out and do something different. So, so there's six elements of conversion research that I'm going to go over in more detail. First of all, there's web analytics, quite basic. Uh, visitor recordings, heat maps, surveys and polls, user testing, and expert reviews. So the first one, researching with web analytics. Now, you have to realize that web analytics is, is not just for reporting on traffic and KPIs, and you know it's not just for reporting monkeys. Um, using, doing research with web analytics is an in-depth analysis that will form the quantitative part of your conversion research. And it's going to help reveal pages and traffic sources with the highest potential to improve in terms of conversion rate optimization. The, then the key metrics that you're going to want to check are uh, um, obviously conversion rates and bounce rates in various different reports in, in web analytics. And I also recommend doing a, uh, an audit of your web analytics, first of all, 
to make sure that it's tracking correctly, you know, things like whether you've got your goals set up correctly. Because if you, if, you, if you don't even have your goals set up correctly, then it's going to be hard to get these um, insights from web analytics research to figure out exactly what does need improving. So I, um, many, many websites that, that I encounter have issues even with um, basic uh, um, page naming or, or duplicate page issues or, um, uh, or um, queries in there that are making several different um, page names different even though they should all be one. So that's important too. Now here are some, here's an example of web analytics research. This is one of the most important um, reports you can use in Google Analytics to, to, to determine some really strong insights for conversion research. This is the landing pages report. Um, and here you can see that these are the top pages where someone would be landing on your website. And this is important because this is going to be their first impression of your website. And they'll often judge your whole website based on that initial landing page that you're on, often within five to 10 seconds. It's really critical that you get these um, optimized. Now you can see that the first um, one is often your, your landing, your home page. Um, and that I've um, circled the two most important metrics there that you want to pay attention to these and kind of see how they're varying. So there's bounce rate. Um, you want to get that as low, low as possible. 40% is about average. Um, and then e-commerce conversion rate. So that is really important to um, optimize as well. Don't always be bogged down on um, comparing this to you know, industry standards or, or anything. Um, this should really be all about improving what you currently have. Don't go off there thinking, oh, these are, this other competitor has XYZ conversion rate because every website is different. So that's important to point out here. But anyway, this is the, the most important um, uh, report you can use in, in any analytics tool. Now here are some quick wins. So uh, as I just mentioned, now, always identify the top landing pages uh, and always look at the ones with the lowest conversion rates and optimize pay attention to those and optimize those first. You should be tracking your traffic source reports for improvement ideas. Um, one thing that I will always look for is not only ones that aren't converting very well, but ones that aren't actually um, showing up in a large amount of volume. Often one that I don't see appearing high enough is email, and often email is one of the highest converting traffic sources. So if you see that your email traffic is only about 5%, then you know you've got huge potential there to drive more traffic to your website by email, you know, using things like email autoresponders and building up a relationship by that. Um, obviously, the funnel visualization report is hugely important because that's going to reveal which pages have the highest drop-off rate for your funnels. So whether that's your checkout or your sign-up flow. Um, you should always check your conversion rates on desktop versus mobile. Because mobile is generally always going to be lower than desktop, but sometimes it is very, very low, which indicates that there's going to be usability issues on mobile that you'll need to fix in particular. Then another quick tip here is to, to create segments for your high value user groups um, to discover what they do differently than uh, visitors who don't convert, for example. That's really a, 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 a one I recommend there. And then and you should also try to look beyond just traditional web analytics tools and use specific um, tools for analysis, like form analysis tools. So Formissimo is a, is a really good one for that, and Hotjar has a option for this, and it actually will let you understand which fields that people are dropping off from in your forms, which is really important, because if you don't know that, and there may be a field that you have that people don't understand, or um, that's causing them to drop off too often. So I highly recommend using other tools like that. Um, with, with the web analytics. So next is uh, researching with visitor recordings. This is this, this means you can watch exactly what visitors are doing on your website. You know everything they click on, um, which pages they which pages they go to, how far they scroll, which things they um, are interacting with. It's it's amazing. Like I mean, I could just sit there and watch visitors all day long on people's websites and find it amazing exactly what they do do and what they don't do. Um, and never presume <laughs> that, they, that uh, they are doing what you want them to do. And this is really great for discovering visitor issues um, for improving. So if you, if you see they're struggling, keep going backwards and forwards between a page of your checkout, then you know that there's probably going to be something wrong with that. If you see them um, returning to a pricing page and, and, and 
moving their mouse over a specific thing that is in, going to indicate some confusion there. So there's, um, it's going to outline many issues for you to improve. You can, um, you, you can set up these visitor recordings and start watching them using tools like Hotjar, Full Story, and Visual Web Optimizer have a new um, CRO platform that you can um, watch these recordings on too. Then with these, I would always recommend starting with an objective in mind to focus on rather than just mindlessly watching different videos uh, um, of the visitor recordings. So for example, you, you might want to have a session where you gain insights to improving particular pages, or you may want to have another um, business recording viewing session where you're checking just for usability issues. Um, and, I, and I would also recommend you sitting down with um, your UX team if you have one to do this too, to get some additional input into that, and because um, they're obviously going to be very um, experienced with doing so. Then um, I would always check recordings for insights that relate to pages that you want to improve and for pages that you will be running A-B tests on. So rather than um, just thinking you know what they're doing on these pages that you want to improve, always check it at exactly what most people seem to be doing on there because it will help you form some really good ideas for what to improve on those pages. Okay, so that's really important too. Here's a quick example of a visitor recording. Play this so you can get an idea. So this is on my services page. Someone is moving around, wanting to see what's included, scrolling up and down a bit. Um, so you can see exactly what they highlight, which is really good. Um, very interesting. And then you'll be able to see that they're actually giving a click on another page um, to show interest. So this, I really highly recommend this. And just a quick short one. So uh, next, here's some quick wins for visitor recordings. So a good general objective would be to watch at least 10 videos for your key pages, like your top entry pages, um, where you obviously could check Google Analytics for that, or your sign up pages or your checkout. Then you'd also want to check out um, some on mobile versus desktop. Uh, don't waste time watching ones that are under 30 seconds that don't have any interactions. Luckily, you can set up this in many of these tools that, so that it doesn't even record them. So, because obviously you can't really determine much if they just get there and scroll up and down for 10 seconds um, and then leave. It's going to be hard to um, in, uh, imply what's going on there. Then another really interesting thing that I like is watching for rage clicks on the specific page elements, which is when someone will click on something, you know, really, really aggressively for, um, for, for whatever, 10 seconds, uh, which indicates they're annoyed with something um, or something is broken. Uh, so. And luckily, some tools also will automate that. I think even actually Hotjar are now um, introducing that in their latest update, which is going to be really exciting. So you should also look for page elements um, that visitors seem to get stuck on, like um, particular form fields that they may be abandoning on. That's going to be really useful. Um, and if you notice anything like that, you should be trying to add tool tips next to those fields that explain what um, what they're asking, why, why that information is being asked for. So that's just one example of what you can do to improve that. Then lastly here, quick win is, you should always try to look for this sort of behavior that may mean that people, the visitors are comparing um, on other websites or searching for, for some missing information on Google. Now, what you, always, you, what you might often see is that they are going to move their mouse up all the way to the tab bar. And then they'll then it'll come back down immediately because obviously it doesn't um, know what they're doing and it, it will continue the session straight away when they come back. But typically, when you see them go up and back down again immediately, that means they've gone off and they've searched for um, either information that's missing on Google, or whatever, or that they're on a, um, they're comparing a price or something. It depends what page that they're doing this on. So that can be really useful information to look out for and um, to bear in mind rather than just not knowing what they're doing. So. Remember that one. Next is to research with heat maps. And this is a good complement to uh, visitor recordings because it's going to show you this web page interaction data in, in, in a numbers format uh, rather than more uh, more qualitative format where you actually watch what they're doing. So don't just presume you know what visitors are going to click on and how far they scroll on your pages. And often it can be quite different and you may be very surprised. Uh, you can use, again, tools like Hotjar and BWO, and there's also Crazy Egg that will help you create heat maps. 
um, you should always try and find the top clicks and the scroll depth on your key pages in particular. I'll talk about some other um, quick wins in a second. The other reason why this is good is because it will reveal call to actions, images, and content that should be clicked on more, which therefore will probably indicate that the, the visitors are having some confusion or that these items that, um, are not prominent enough on that page. So that will help give you some information to kind of reorganize the page and make things a bit more prominent or explain things a bit better. Here's an example of a uh, heat map with one of my clients. Here you can see that, that um, obviously a lot of um, the, the, the redder the section is, as you can see this hot here, that means more clicks are on that. And so they're, they're clicking on the get started button here or the pricing here. And you can also see where they're clicking um, of what they're most interested. So you can see they're obviously interested in the money back guarantee um, because it's quite quite um, clicked quite often there. And then you can even um, show heat maps by different device up here. And then um, as I'll explain in a second anyway, that you can do not just clicks, but moving and scrolling, which can be very useful as well. So that's an example there. Here's some quick wins. Look for CTA buttons or links that are not getting as many clicks as you expect, because um, obviously you want to make sure some of those really important ones are uh, more heavily promoted, so maybe making them bolder, uh, making them larger to, to, to make them stand out a bit better. Um, don't just click, check click maps. Mouse movements um, are often going to reveal insightful pattern, patterns of, of how people are, are scrolling through your pages and what they're looking at. Um, some people say there's a correlation actually between what people look at and where the mouse movements are, but the, the jury is still out on that. Scroll maps are important too, um, and it's always really important to ensure that your key content is is actually above the page fold line. You don't want to be um, burying some useful things like social proof um, below the page fold line because you may find that you know 25% of your visitors don't even get that far, so therefore don't see important information. You should also be looking for elements that are getting many clicks that aren't actually clickable. So this can actually happen, happen quite often. So therefore, that's going to indicate that your visitors are confused and want to click on that. So if you notice that, you may want to actually make that clickable and take it to a page that explains whatever that is in more detail. Or perhaps it's an element that looks like a button and it isn't a button. That's another thing that you'd want to pay attention to. Um, and always review heat maps for pages that you want to improve or A-B test. Do this first um, before anything else because you want to know what people are clicking on and, and not clicking on to get an understanding of what to, maybe you need to move things slightly as well as um, improving the page. Um, and then this can happen too if you don't really have much web traffic and you want to kind of get an idea of um, what people are clicking on. Um, and you only, you know, you're only getting 100 clicks in the case in, in the space of a month or two. It's not really going to give you enough data. So you can actually use um, predictive eye tracking tools like Fangui, which will basically feed uh, one of your an image into their algorithm and then tell you what are the most likely things that people are going to be looking at. So that's really useful. So next is the research with surveys and polls. So the voice of your visitors is the most important thing in commercial optimization. Please remember this, because without your visitors, you're, you, you don't have a business. Uh, so therefore, it, it, the voice of um, them is so important that you need to pay attention to. So it's really important to find out what they like and, and they don't like. And the best way, to, one of the best ways to do that is by using surveys and polls. And it's crucial to ask good questions here with these surveys and polls and not rush into setting this up. You know, don't just spend 10 minutes setting up uh, some polls or, or surveys. You've really got to think about the types of questions that should be in there and personalize those for your visitors' needs. Uh, don't just take the um, generic questions that you see out there and copy and paste them into your um, survey or poll and hope you're going to get good results. So you should be creating single uh, question polls on key pages to get specific feedback. And you should be creating visitor on-site surveys and send customer surveys via email. So those are the three most important ways to use surveys and polls. And you can do this using Hotjar, Quadru, and VWO. So here's an example of a, a poll, with a single page poll that's been created here. Um, and this is in Visual Ops Optimizer. Um, here, there's, there's the question that you're asking here. You can um, 
change the type of question here. Um, you can, there's some advanced options here. You can make it optional. And here is a live preview of what that question would look like. Um, and often they will pop up in the, the, the bottom right or the bottom left. You can customize the colors. You've, you've probably seen these quite often on different websites, but very, very useful indeed. So next. So some quick wins. So um, I always recommend setting up um, single question polls on key pages like your product or, product or pricing pages. So for example, on your pricing page, you would have a pop-up that asks, um, is, is our pricing clear and easy to understand? Or a product page, you could say, um, is there any information on this page that you think is missing um, that would help you? Are those are good questions to ask, because then based on what you find, you can make tweaks to those pages. And don't use pop-up surveys or polls too soon. Don't show them too soon. You've got to give your visitors time, because often if you do it too quickly, they're not going to know enough to be able to, to actually give you any interesting um, responses. They're just going to they're just going to minimize it. Or you can actually use exit intent, which actually works quite well. So if people are going to leave your website, you can actually ask them, what was was there anything missing that stopped them from purchasing? Um, that's a useful um, thing to do with the survey and, and poll. Um, you should also automate the sending of a customer survey. Don't just send them out once every six months or so, but you can even um, send them out to go out whatever a week after they've signed up using email automation tools. And here are the two most insightful questions that you should be including in a customer survey. First of all, was there anything that nearly stopped you from purchasing from us? Now, this is so important because if you don't know those things that nearly stopped you from purchasing from, um, from us or from you, then you, it's hard to act on those. The, the people that will know what nearly stopped you from purchasing are going to be the people who did purchase. Because if you, you can't ask this question to the people who didn't purchase because they're, they're gone. So one of the best ways of asking this is to ask those people, um, your surveys, uh, your customers, who, what were these reasons that nearly stopped you from purchasing from us? And once you know that, you can then try to, uh, to uh, uh, um, um, try and um, make changes to your website to uh, make that much clearer anything that seems to be missing. So that's a really important question to always ask. You can even ask it in a, in a poll on, on a thanks page too, if you don't want to send a customer survey. Now, the second one is, what were the biggest factors that influenced your decision to purchase? So then this goes. This is um, really important to understand because if you don't really know what it is that's influencing this, you're just going to be guessing like, mm, well, uh, uh, is it price that they're most concerned with, or oh, maybe it's free shipping, so maybe I do that. So if you if you ask them um, and you get um, enough responses in a particular um, direction, you can add that information to your website and make it much more prominent, and therefore you'll get more sales and your conversion rates will increase. So those two are really important. Then to get actually to get more survey response, which often can be a challenge, you're going to want to do things like offer some incentives, like gift certificates. So go go and do that. Next is by researching with user testing, a great way to gather customer voices to get your target audience to try to complete tasks on your website and actually ask them questions and see to see what they think of it. And then this actually allows you to watch and listen to a tester using your website who is trying to complete tasks. Uh, that you give them, and then we'll answer the questions that you give them. And it's a little bit like um, a visitor recording session, but it's interactive, and you can actually hear them giving their responses um, and what they're clicking on. It's just it's just fascinating. I mean, yeah, I mean, I said visitor recordings were really interesting, but this is some some of the most revealing content you can come up with in terms of uh, conversion research. Uh, it's great for finding out exactly what people think of your website, their issues with it, and what needs improving. Well, um, you can use tools like userfeel or usertesting.com to do this. Um, and you can also do this user testing in a live moderated format in a, in a lab. Um, this is a lot more expensive, but it, but it is going to be even more useful because if you, if you actually see them on a particular page and they seem to be having trouble with something, you can ask them, like, oh, go back to this. Um, can you tell me a bit more about why you did that or what your impressions of this were? So rather than just having it scripted, which is what um, this remote um, this remote user testing tools do, you can actually interact with your visitors to get more feedback and more research and insights. 
Now here's just a quick example of um, a, a user test. All right, it looks like we're ready to begin. Step one, look around so you can the see page up, 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 up there, you can see people. Um, this is a task. So someone has to go to Ticketmaster in this case. Ticketmaster. Um, this says look around the homepage and talk about what you think this site is about. Uh, and uh, now the guy will be talking about this. Scrolling through different things, it looks and then you can see he's giving way. his opinion on There's different things that he notices um, as he goes through the Ticketmaster website. He's still on task website, one here. Try to no, he's still on, no, he's on task place, two. Also so you can ask like 10 different tasks or questions. Um, and it's really important to make sure you're asking overall, the relevant ones there. That, uh, um, and you, and also asking how easy it was to complete the tasks. Like, as you can see the, uh, up here, there's a little thing saying overall this task was very difficult or easy to complete. So not only do you get the um, qualitative, but you get the quantitative side of things too, so you can analyze it. So you've got to find out which tasks were the easiest or the most difficult to complete. And then obviously you're going to want to pay attention to the ones that are most difficult and try to optimize those. Okay, so that's 11 minutes. Typically there will be uh, between 10 and 20 minutes. Um, uh, so that's going to vary depending on um, how detailed the person is is getting to do in the user test. Now, uh, let's go to the next slide. So here's some quick wins. So you should gather five to 10 user tests at least on desktop and mobile. Uh, always use pre-screen pre -screen questions to ensure the testers meet your target audience. Um, because there are some of the cheaper user testing ones that will just use their own pool of testers and you have no idea who they are. Maybe, maybe you're, you're on a B2B website um, and you end up getting user tests from moms who are at home, obviously not going to be very useful for you. So make sure you use tools, uh, you know, like userfeel and usertesting.com. They definitely let you put pre-screening questions in this. So that they find the right people for you to give you that um, really insightful research. Um, get, so get them to complete major tasks on your website, come up with those. This is going to give you some great insights. Then this is another one that I really like doing here is that I get them to find a competitor website and see what they prefer on it. And, um, and actually you can ask them actually to go and find one rather than even tell them which one to go to. So you're, you can actually even see what ones that people are most interested in from Google search result, for example. Um, so that's really good ideas for understanding what people prefer and what they don't. I highly recommend that. Um, you can also do user testing on wireframes or mockups to get some initial feedback when you're considering um, improving something. And then you should always do this user testing for proposed A-B test variations um, to get feedback on it, i.e. after you've done that initial round of feedback on the wireframes or mockups. Um, and then, then you would make some more tweaks before you actually launch those based on the feedback that you get. Okay. Next is to research with expert conversion optimization reviews. These are these reviews are often uh, these these are, these are done by experienced CRO expert, and they're often called heuristic analysis. It's, it's a very fast, effective way of getting conversion optimization insights and recommendations for your website. Uh, they're offered by CRO experts, including myself, Conversion Excel, and Wide Funnel. Uh, in in with these uh, expert CRO reviews, each website page is reviewed and assessed using best practice criteria. Now you may have already heard of the wider funnel one who have their lift model, which is uh, one of the most popular ones that you may have seen. But I also created one called the convert website success model. Um, and here are some, so I have captivation, unique value proposition, credibility and trust, incentives and CTAs, and then one that works against everything is gonna be friction and barriers. So I'll let you know how you can actually grab this later on. But that's, this is going to be a really important one because if you could do all the other types of research and it's going to work for you, but this will be the quickest thing that you can do because obviously, a, hopefully, a CRO expert is going to um, know best practices because they've analyzed so many websites in the past. Um, so I definitely recommend that too. So, and then just a quick summary of the other CRO elements so you know how this all kind of fits together. Website persuasion for CRO. Um, so you also need to persuade your visitors to convert and don't just hope that they will. Um, and copywriting plays a really big part of this persuasion. Now headlines, bullet points, and, and call 
attractions are often the most important things that you want to do with copywriting. One thing that I always recommend uh, clients to do is to uh, mention how your website solves for pain points and then, and then explain the benefits of those rather than just having you know, like a generic headline that uses some kind of marketing fluff or salesy, cheesy um, headline, which you know it's, it's fine, but it's not really going to engage on an emotional level, which is really what you want people to do. So then on the uh, other side of the uh, um, um, persuasion is the influence techniques like social proof, urgency, scarcity, and reciprocity. And these were made famous by Robert Cialdini's influence book, which, which has been out many years now, probably 20 years now. So I would definitely recommend going to read that easy. You had a follow-up book recently on that. Now, out of these, I think social proof is actually particularly essential to show prominently because um, if you don't have this social proof, people are going to get to your website and going to think, huh, hmm, no one, is, no one seems to be using this, or how do I know this is popular, how do I know this is any good? So if you put content on there that, that implies that other people are liking it, it's going to increase the chances of the, that person liking it, and then hopefully buying or converting. Um, other things, uh, so the, the, the top ways of you doing that would be to obviously include reviews and ratings. And you'll be surprised how many websites don't include it because they, they look at other, some big websites feel like they don't need to put ratings and reviews. And so therefore these smaller websites can say, oh, well, XYZ, that's a huge website and they don't need, they don't actually have ratings and reviews anymore. So they think they don't need to, but it, it is so important, particularly if your website is not known very well. Uh, other things to add on are testimonials um, as featured in kind of modules where you put logos of any websites that you've been mentioned in or um, new sites uh, um, or magazines that people are going to think, ah, oh, okay, um, that's good. That I know that magazine or website. I trust that the fact that you've been featured there. Um, and adding in the logos of your well-known customers that will also help depending on what type of um, website you have. Showing urgency and scarcity messages can work very well too. Use FOMO.com, I highly recommend that. But please don't go to travel website extremes though, you know, like where you want, if you go on hotels.com or booking.com and you get bombarded with these things that say, last room available, or um, Joe Blogs um, um, checked out this hotel um, uh, one hour ago, you know, all these things to, to make you try and book quicker. And actually in the UK there are they're announcing some changes there that are going to prevent them from doing that, which is very interesting. So user experience, um, is there other element of conversion optimization? And it's important because it doesn't matter how persuasive your website is, if visitors don't find it easy to use. I mean, it could be the world's best looking website, but if they don't find it easy to use, they're not going to convert. So it's really important too. Um, so you should always try to adopt website usability best practices, um, things to pay pay attention to in particular your navigation, your forms, your user flow elements, um, because they're going to have some of the biggest impact on your um, website experience and therefore the ability to convert. Uh, best practice UX improvements should, in my opinion, just be launched and you don't really need to A-B test those, particularly um, if there's, you know, like a, um, there's a field error messaging that it doesn't seem to be working very well, um, that's something that you just need to, to launch rather than A-B test that because even if the A-B test didn't, uh, you did it and it didn't work, it's obvious that that, would, that should work because it's the best practice. Um, one thing to pay attention to is don't just, just launch some of these newer UX trends. You know, there's lots of things appearing like new navigation um, menus. Um, you know, certainly don't just launch a hamburger menu on a desktop site in the top left corner because while they look trendy on web design agencies or things like that, they're so unusable when they're not used on mobile and should not be used on desktop. So um, do do uh, like always try to test any UX trends before you launch them because it may actually negatively impact your um, experience and your conversion rates. Use tooltips for your yields um, or pieces of content that require explaining. That's really going to be helpful to increase your um, user experience, the usability of your website. 
Um, improve error handling on form fields to ensure greater completion rates. Um, that's something that, that often gets neglected because it's so far down the, the funnel. Um, and often developers just handle that, so pay attention to doing that with the user experience. Um, and then just lastly, another quick tip here is to make buttons and links fat finger friendly when they're looking at your website on a mobile device. So um, I make them much bigger um, because fingers can often um, press the wrong button if links are close together or um, you know they have to zoom in a bit more and it's annoying. So make sure you do that. Um, with a responsive website in particular. Then uh, the last element of conversion representation is A-B testing and personalization. Obviously, I'm not going to spend much time on this um, A-B testing part, but you should really also go beyond it by doing some personalization. So instead of once having a one-size-fits-all website, you should be trying to personalize it to engage and convert more visitors. So headlines and hero images, they are particularly good for personalizing because you know, they're often going to be at the top of home pages and your, your landing pages. So they, they're going to be noticed quite well and, and when you personalize those. Um, so here are some business segments that you can target with more relevant content in particular. So you can uh, target returning visitors with content that relates to what they saw previously. So if they saw a particular product several times before, you can actually mention that on the home page um, or a particular um, section. Then you can also target things like frequent purchases with loyalty content like rewards or discounts because ultimately you want to pay attention to those types of um, uh, visitors to get them to continue using the website. Now, next I want to go over what's called the CRO success flow. Now, um, this, is, this is important because all these elements of CRO shouldn't be just done randomly. So you really need a continuous CRO process which is needed for success. So I kind of came up with this CRO success flow. So the first step is conversion research, which obviously we've gone over in a lot of detail. Um, then that feeds into CRO ideation, which also um, gets fed into along with the website persuasion and UX CRO elements. Um, and that's where you then come up with those ideas of for what you would want to improve or A-B test. Then essentially they need to be um, prioritized here. Um, this is important to ensure you launch ideas with the highest impact and not just launch um, tests or things on pages that you know that don't get much traffic or don't get seen much or aren't going to have a very big impact on your revenue. And then one of the other most important parts here is the uh, after launching and improving the A-B test, which is step four, is the review, learning, and iterate, step five, which then feeds back into step one, and then the process continues again. I'm not going to go into much detail here because this this is a whole other um, topic. But I just wanted to briefly mention some of these most important ones before I continue. Though um, you know, mentioned prioritization of your CRO ideas. This is really important um, to do because obviously not all your ideas are going to have a good impact. Particularly if you're um, pooling ideas from other members of your um, your company who like to think they know what they are. Are doing, but they may just have you know suggestions which aren't particularly that useful. But um, you may have to try and prioritize them because that, that's that's what might um, be recommended in your company that everyone should be able to contribute. So that's why prioritization is particularly important there. Um, you should also you should try to look for low hanging fruit, as it's called, because that that is and that's content that's going to be easier to launch first. I um, improving your text or your imagery, and these and some of these can help you get some really quick wins, and therefore that will hopefully get you more budget for conversion optimization and buy-in from your seniors. Um, so that's really important to do. Yeah, I would always suggest using a prioritizer tool to find the ideas which have the highest potential impact or rating. Now, CXL has a rate one you can use, but I also created one that you can use here, so, so you can see. Um, as the idea description, uh, um, and then success factors. So how many uh, how many insights support this? Uh, likely impact on the site goal, and then you've got the ease of designing visuals, ease of developing, these are the ease of launch factors. That then gives you an overall idea rating that you then you would sort uh, and, and launch those ones first. And this is one of the key things that you need to pay attention to is the how many good insights support this. Because if um, 
and i.e. your conversion research, because if you're not getting many other things that are um, mentioning why this is important, then this, that could be just, you know, like a guess or a hippo idea because nothing, nothing really else is supporting it. So that's always important to remember that. And lastly, is that you should always review, learn and iterate from your CRO efforts, um, particularly the impact on your KPIs after launching an improvement or not after launching any of your winning A-B test results. So you should always be reviewing the impact on your conversion rate and revenue very, very, very important. And not just, you know, um, before, you know, during the A-B test, if you're doing an A-B test or previous few weeks, um, if you're just launching something, but you need to do year over year, particularly if you've got seasonality or an e-commerce website. Um, and if you have no noticeable difference um, after, uh, after launching an improvement or an A-B, a B test, that's one, then you're going to want to again review that and look for learnings and see why that may not have worked as well as you had hoped. So you should always learn from your efforts in, in commercial optimization, whether they have a good impact or a fail. It's all about learning how to uh, um, improve uh, and learn from your mistakes and learn from your successes. Because the, the more the, the, those you, that you do, the more experience you'll have, you'll have more things to um, be able to create better tests in the future uh, and better improvements in the future. Um, don't just throw away your A-B tests that fail. I, this is quite common as well. You should do conversion research on each variation and look through insights for why it failed. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, doing um, getting some user testing done on the different variations to, to figure out why people might not have liked a particular variation would, would, is important, and then looking at visitor recordings of each um, of the, the A-B test variations to kind of understand how people are interacting with them. Um, and then what you learn there will help you come up with a better A-B test. So yeah, so but basically you just want to be using these learnings that I've just mentioned to iterate on your improvements or A-B tests uh, to come up with even better ones. So really, really important because then that feeds back into doing more conversion research and back into the process that I just mentioned. So um, uh, there's a lot of content to go through there, very big topic, but I wanted to just give a quick overview um, of particularly conversion research to go beyond A-B testing. So if you're looking for some um, CRO help, if anything particular, please feel free to contact me for a free consultation. You can just, just email me with that link there. And I also recommend checking out my uh, CRO toolbox, which includes my website improve, improvement prioritizer tool that I went over earlier, and also my convert website success model that I briefly mentioned. And there's the link for it there. So thanks again. And now I'm going to open it up um, to, to ask some questions about this, about commercial optimization and this presentation. Sure, Rich. Uh, that was really a great presentation. <laughs> and I'm sure uh, the audience must have loved it too. Uh, and one thing which I would really want to highlight, uh, all the entire presentation was great, but this thing, this particular point really stood out was uh, that the voice of your customers is the most important thing in CRO. Right? You need to listen to your customers and you need to plan things around whatever they, ha they have to say, whatever they have to tell you. Yeah, totally. Right. Cool. So uh, we'll start with the Q&A. And of course, I'll take advantage of my uh, moderator privileges. And I'll, uh, ask, I'll be the first one to ask you a question. So uh, we talked about uh, failing AB, uh, the failed A-B test, right? So uh, six out of eight, seven A-B tests fail. This yeah. does bring down the team's morale uh, up to a certain extent. So I would like to know from you, uh, how does uh, a marketing manager who or a growth manager or whoever is in charge of running uh, online experiments how should they take these how should they look at these uh, tests as uh, test results as positive and let uh, keep their morales up and high and keep testing more and more yeah i mean it's just important to uh, make them understand as i mentioned that, that conversion optimization you know it's a learning process and that you can't just be expected to um, create tests that always win, it's impossible. 
I mean, even some of the best agencies out there um, only have like a one well, only, but much better. But they'll have you know fifty to sixty percent um, uh, winning rate for their A/B tests. So pointing that out would also help. Um, uh, just um, helping understand uh, that you need to be analyzing with a wider team, um, getting more resources uh, to, to do A-B testing, um, getting some maybe some outside help for a while to, to really try and you know, move the needle, so to speak, is going to be um, important to do. Um, incentivizing uh, teams is, can, can work well, so if you if you launch particular improvements or A/B tests and they they hit conversion rate improvements X Y Z by a certain amount um, that also helps to try and build a buzz for this um, making presentations internally um, having you know brown box kind of lunch sessions where you review what's going on you know just make it really exciting for everyone and, and often I find that people are really fascinated by this stuff because everyone has an opinion on the, the website that they work with so they all they, they want to know what's being done about it and uh, how it's going to be improved great right so uh, the next question is coming from Linda Lee uh, I'm sorry Linda if I pronounced your name wrong uh, so Linda asks uh, what if we what if when we had a conclusive result for one web page but it failed when applying for a different web page, although it is the same test for improvement. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've heard of this before, definitely, that you know, trying to take a test result and apply on a different page, in theory, it sounds like it will work, but there could be multiple reasons for that. Um, particularly, you know, traffic sources could change, the types of um, visitors could be slightly different on that page. Um, you, the test you have got a winning result with, you may have got lucky with the fact that you found a winning variation um, and when you actually went to launch it and um, analyze it over time, you, then you might actually see, oh, that actually wasn't working as well as I expected. So it all depends on what the insight and hypothesis was in the first place and how many insights from conversion research that supported it. So that, that should try and um, alleviate that fact. But I always would suggest trying not to use A-B tests um, on other pages. Sometimes it works, but it all depends on what that was that you were trying to apply um, on other pages as well. Right. Hope you got your answer, Linda. Uh, so the next question uh, is that there is a lot of talk about personalization. Uh, but what it really is. Yeah. I mean, so it, yeah, it's, it's, beyond, it's beyond just using your first name and last name. It's it's beyond that, right, Rich? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, it, you, you really need to be trying to show content that, um, that engages them better, therefore content that they've engaged with previously. Or, you know, it's like when you go into your local coffee shop and, and uh, but the, the barrister knows what your favorite order is and they're going to they're going to know your name and and also they're going to know your favorite beverage um that's going to be much more engaging for them and it's going to increase the chances of them coming back to that coffee shop rather than another one um so the same kind of principle works with websites um unfortunately you do sometimes need quite a lot of traffic to make it make it work um well and there's tools out there that, that use algorithms to kind of automate all of this, but um, it's something that definitely is a buzzword that you often hear of in the industry, but I would always recommend doing conversion rate optimization and get up, get your website up to a certain standard first before doing personalization, because um, ultimately, uh, you know, if it's like the analogy of if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. So if you put personalization on a website that doesn't convert very well or is not usable, is still not going to convert very well, even though you personalized it. So it's really important to do commercial optimization to get up to a certain standard first before you know getting serious with uh, personalization. Right. So the next question is uh, how to avoid. Uh, that's interesting. How to avoid analysis paralysis? 
Oh, that's a more analysis process. Yeah, that, I've, I've, I've definitely seen that um, many times before, particularly with their um, A-B test results. One thing that I would try to, to not do is don't choose five different um, success metrics and try and analyze them all at the same time. Pick a, a major success metric um, and then pick some more minor ones. And if it fails on the major one, you could kind of look to see whether there's multiple minor success metrics, you know, like whether it's bounce rate or um, time on site or something that all add up. And that might give you some ammunition to think, okay, this has got some more potential to do further testing on this. But yeah, so that's going to help with some analysis. Um, don't get too granular. Um, with, with, with anything, um, even with analytics, you've got to realize you need enough, big enough samples to make conclusions. Um, so if you're drilling down on a page, kind of this is a segment that only has, you know, 100 visitors in the last um, month, you're obviously going to find it hard to make any meaningful data from that. So while it is good to drill down, you always need to have enough data to be able to um, make it meaningful um, and and just you know try to um, try to cut off the t amount of time you spend on certain things um, there's always um, other things to work on that may yield better results you know it's that the 80 20 rule where 80% um, um, of your work um, is, is going to be the results are going to be in 20% of the area. So um, if, you, if you're spending a lot of time on one thing in particular, not likely that it's going to be that one that's going to be the, the, the most impactful. So you want to try um, many different things in order to find out what that biggest impact is, biggest lever. Right. Good. Uh so Kimberly uh, Jeso uh, asks, uh, she's actually looking for tips on writing persuasively. Do you have any, Rich? Um, yeah, tips on writing persuasively. This is where it's really important to understand your visitors, and the mindset of them and what their emotions are and what they are going to be thinking um, when they're landing on your pages. So, you know, um, what pain points they have is really important to understand and, and addressing their pain points with um, good copy. That's going to be really persuasive. Um, and then another really good thing to use when they're further down the funnel is to use urg urgency and scarcity tactics, which you quite often see out there um, to try and get people to act uh, um, on <coughs> quickly or, you know, if you've got a whatever it is, a, a limited time offering that, that's going to close um, and only opens twice a year, those types of things can work really well. But again, it depends on what your your business, business type is. Right. So yes, uh, I think we're short on time. So I'll just take two more questions, guys. I'm really sorry. We'll answer the other questions uh, personally via email. So our second last question uh, to you is coming from Emma. Uh, so Emma asks, uh, how do you deal uh, with a very long conversion path and funnel? Would you focus on CTR opposed to end conversion? Sorry, can you say it again? Sure. Uh, so Emma is asking, uh, what what if a website has a very long conversion path and funnel? Yeah. Uh, would you then be focusing on just the click through rates, or should you be focusing on the end conversion? Yeah, if you've got a really long one with multiple different entry points into it, it's going to be tough to analyze um, in terms of a, a traditional funnel. You could uh, yeah, analyze um, the next steps from different t types of pages. You know, um, you can use content groupings to understand um, the click-through rates to the next pages. And you can use e-commerce um, enhanced tracking to uh, customize your your shopping behavior to group different um, areas together that's a really good thing you can do that you, you don't even need to just have e-commerce sites for you can use this e-commerce shopping behavior reporting for um, different types of businesses you obviously need to get some development to help you out with that but 
that's really um, important to do. Um, and then the other, I guess the other disadvantages with long funnels is the, um, in Google Analytics, you can't easily um, uh, create funnels on the fly. You have to create them in advance. If you want to upgrade to the 360 version, you can actually create funnels on the fly and uh, get historical data on that. So that's really useful. And you can do that built in in um, Adobe Analytics as well. So that's good if you've got longer forms there. Um, but then if, and then if you don't have enough um, conversions anyway, then you definitely need to be looking at CTRs um, as a uh, click through between each page and um, understanding where most people are dropping off. Um, you could also use those form analysis tools that I mentioned if, if there are a particular lot of forms on your multi-step pages to see where people are dropping out. That's another way of analyzing long funnels. Right. Sure. So one last quick question. Uh, it's coming from Arthur. Uh, so uh, he's just he's asking, uh, do you offer services to agencies? Do I offer what? Sorry. Do you offer services to agencies? Yes. Yes. I, I certainly can help agencies with their with their clients. Um, sure, Arthur. Great. So Arthur, you can uh, directly reach out to Rich and yes. have a conversation yeah. with him. Uh, and don't forget, guys, to. Uh, uh, Reach out to Rich for any question that you have. Yeah, sure. After Definitely. Webinar. Yeah. webinar. Cool. So yeah, with that, it's time to close this webinar. Uh, it's been a really interesting presentation. Uh, and thank you so much, Rich, for your time and effort that you've put in. Thanks for having me. That was very wonderful. Useful. Yeah, great. And yeah, and thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar and staying till the end. Uh, please fill in the survey. That will turn up once the webinar is closed. Uh, your feedback will help us a long way. Also. Uh, don't forget to register for our next webinar with TARS, where we are going to discuss how to make post-click experience engaging with conversational landing pages. Have a good day, everyone.